course, Bill Gorin, and I'm with uh, uh, Mick Silver Institute and CTAC. Um, and today's webinar is on uh, telepsychiatry. And I'm uh, happy to um, say that we are uh, joined by our, our state partners uh, from New York State uh, OMH, and also one of our provider partners um, from Esther Services to talk about telepsychiatry. But before we jump into the, today's presentation, um, just uh, some basic housekeeping rules just to quickly go through uh, for those of you who might be joining us for the first time. Um, one is just to underscore this uh, presentation is being recorded, uh, and both slides and the presentation will be available um, on our website, or the CTAC website. Um, so just wanted to make sure folks uh, knew that. And also, we encourage that you submit your questions um, throughout the presentation by using the chat box, um, which is, uh, should be for most of you probably on the bottom right-hand corner. Um, so we strongly recommend you chat uh, those questions in. We will be collecting those questions throughout the presentation, and then at the end, um, trying to, you know, we'll try to get to as many of those questions as possible um, at that time. And, uh, and then, you know, and if not, uh, those questions that we can get today, um, we'll be sharing with our partners who are presenting and try to get those out to all the participants uh, at a later time. So again, uh, thank you for uh, joining us. Um, as the presenters come on and do their portion of the presentation, they will introduce themselves as well. Um, and uh, without any further ado, I'm gonna pass this over to uh, Amy Smith at OMH, who will start us off with this uh, presentation. Thank you, Boris. Um, I just wanted to start first off by thanking CTAC for asking us to speak about telepsychiatry. Uh, it's a really good opportunity for us to reach a lot of people at once to just give some general information, hopefully clear up some questions, um, and open the dialogue going forward. Um, I have worked at OMH since January of 2015 um, in the Bureau of Inspection and Certification, and uh, telepsychiatry has been one of my projects since I started. Um, so just to give a little bit of history, uh, telepsychiatry was first introduced in regulation in February of um, 2015, and at that time it was within uh, clinic regs, so it was under 599.17, and at that time it was only allowing use between two Article 31 outpatient clinics. Um, last year, in August of 2016, uh, we developed a standalone regulation, Part 596, to expand the use of telepsychiatry. So now the regulations state that any OMH license setting, uh, with the exception of ACT and PROS, can offer this as an additional or optional service. Um, we did add in some limitations at this time to exclude use for medication over objection, restraint and seclusion, um, ordering, and also for Article 9 commitments. Um, we have said that it's certainly okay to um, use this service for consultation related to another physician's examination. That's certainly fine. Um, just to kind of give a highlight of some definitions, when we refer to the spoke site or the originating site, that is where the client is sitting in all cases. And when we refer to the hub or the distant site, that's where the provider is sitting. And that's you know pretty standard going forward also within any mention of um, you know, distant or originating sites within DOH or OASIS, we've tried to keep our language consistent regarding that. Um, currently, right now, the only providers that can offer um, any type of tele telepsychiatry services or psych are a psychiatrist and a psychiatric nurse practitioner. So that's our current limitation. Um, one thing that's important to keep in mind is that uh, Telepsychiatry can be used for contracting purposes as well. So part 596.8 addresses that specifically. And it says that Article 31 licensed sites may contract out with any non-OMH licensed provider to offer telepsych services. In that particular situation, they would be considered the hub site. Uh, we do not require prior approval but the Article 31 provider must notify their local field office of their plan um, within 30 days. 
so that they can assess the potential impact on resource allocation. Uh, we've tried to encourage people to be in touch and notify their field office before they're even going to offer the service to have that discussion. Um, it, we found that that's been helpful going forward. It's important to keep in mind that the hub site physicians must be privileged, credentialed at the spoke site facility, um, and only the spoke site is authorized to bill for services. The hub site should not be submitting, generating a bill. It's only the spoke site where that client is that's billing for services. Any type of telephone conversation, video cell phone interaction, email messages, those are not reimbursable under telepsychiatry. And just looking at some of the technical aspects, and we do address this a little bit in our guidance, but um, in order for a telepsychiatry claim to be, in, to be reimbursed, the video conferencing equipment must be employed, allowing quality synchronous video and voice exchange between the provider and the patient. Um, New York State, our IT department has identified three configuration standards that uh, they've approved for use within OMH state operated sites. Uh, the first is dedicated video conferencing, so very often VTC. The second would be a PC-based solution, so a PC or a laptop and a webcam with speakers, microphone, um, and mobile with tablets. At this point, we are requiring that any one of these configurations have to have the ability for pan, tilt, zoom. Uh, so what we're saying is that the physician at the hub site must have the ability to control the camera at the spoke site. We want them to be able to zoom in closer if they need to see if there's side effects. Um, for any particular reason, we want it to be as close to a true in-person session as it can be. At this point, I don't believe that any of the mobile technology does allow for PTZ. So we're seeing primarily the first two configuration standards, and that's what we've been approving for. Um, Apple FaceTime is not allowed, and also not mentioned on here is Skype. That's not allowed to be used as a service. So that's just kind of what's happening at this point, and then looking forward to what we have coming down the road, um, we're trying to look at a lot of ways to expand telepsychiatry to reach more people. Um, one of the things that we hear a lot from providers is that it's very hard to locate a physician. Um, they may be able to get the equipment and get it installed and, and have the room to do it, and they certainly have the clients, but where do they find the physician to actually provide the services? So one of the first things that we've been looking at is contracting with telemedicine companies that have New York State licensed providers. And we've been able to get information about at least 20 telemedicine companies that have licensed providers in New York State. Um, some of the key provisions that we want to keep in mind is that the agency or the spoke site that's going to contract with the companies must still demonstrate full compliance with all of our regulations, all of Part 596. Uh, OMH must be able to review the contract language to ensure that it does not constitute a corporate practice of medicine issue. And even though the telemedicine company doesn't have to be located in New York State, um, the provider must still be physically located in the state. Even if they're in a private office or a home office, they do have to be physically sitting in New York State. Um, and again, the spoke site is still going to be the site that bills. It would not be the providers, you know, doing any type of billing for that service. Uh, as we get closer to this option, we'll be issuing some guidance. Um, and in the meantime, we've been trying to work pretty closely with DOH and OASIS to kind of coordinate our efforts around this uh, particular issue. Um, another part that goes along with this is we're looking at telemedicine accreditation to satisfy the regulatory requirements. Um, we've been able to connect with two companies in the U.S. that provide this level of accreditation. Uh, both of them are fairly new to offering this type of service. Uh, we have URAC, which is the Utilization Review Accreditation Commission, 
and the ATA, the American Telemedicine Association. Um, and we've been exploring their standards and their procedures. We've had a number of phone calls with both agencies. Um, and we have an upcoming in-person meeting with URAC actually next week so that they can kind of do us, help to show us a walkthrough of, you know, kind of what they would do. The other thing that we're looking to do is kind of expand uh, to include other disciplines that can offer telepsychiatry. Um, so, you know, an example, psychologists, social workers, licensed mental health counselors. Uh, before doing that, we really have to clearly define the subset of services that would be applicable, um, individual therapy, you know, group therapy, what are we looking at before we kind of go to that next level. Um, we're also, along with that, looking to include for services for individuals with limited access to either specialized services or evidence-based practices. Um, one particular population that we're focusing on right now is deaf ASL users, and um, there's only three clinics statewide that provide treatment for this population, and how do we help to get them, you know, to the best most competent care, and it's possible that telepsychiatry could do that. And so in addition, we're also trying to see, could that include some type of home service for these individuals? We're also looking to expand uh, to use within the PROS programs. We think that makes sense coming down the road. And we've had a pilot going for about four months with three hospital systems, with New York Presbyterian Catholic Health Services in Northwell, and we've been exploring um, use of telepsychiatry for Article 9 commitments. And we're just trying to kind of track a lot of data around that in terms of time spent in the emergency room. The hope, obviously, is that this would cut down on an individual's uh, length of stay in a hospital before they're admitted, but we also don't want to see that there's an overuse of admission because of this. So. We're also looking to get out more specific guidance for using telehealth services on inpatient units, which would also include for RTF. Um, we're looking to reach out to our currently approved providers that are using the service within the inpatient setting so that we can talk about their lessons learned. Uh, up to this point, I think we've got about three inpatient providers that are utilizing telepsychiatry. So, we, you know, we want to try to reach out to them and see what's different about providing this on an inpatient unit versus doing it in an outpatient setting, and how can we issue some guidance for other providers around that. And kind of the last piece of what's coming down the road is um, offering some waivers to the CCBHDs and selected mobile crisis providers uh, to allow for iPad communication, really for purposes of making disposition decisions in the field. Um, we've gotten some feedback that this is, you know, something that's really needed and could be a benefit, so we're trying to keep that in mind as an option. So the next. The next thing to kind of keep in mind is just the licensing process in general. And, um, you know, I, I kind of just did a list of the highlights of what's the most important things to keep in mind when you're applying to offer telepsychiatry services within your program. Um, obviously, a lot of this is offered through our, our guidance documents and on the website, but just to kind of give you a highlight. So if you're an agency that's looking to add telepsychiatry services within any of your sites, the first thing that you want to do is you want to go into the Mental Health Provider Data Exchange, or MHPD as it's known, and you're going to want to submit an AA to add telepsychiatry as an optional or an additional service. You're going to want to include all of your supporting documents. There's an attestation that would need to be included. There's a policy and procedure that you'll need to include that's going to very clearly list how you're going to use this service, what are the backup plans should the equipment fail, what's the backup plan if a client is having a psychiatric crisis, how are you going to address that, and there's also a technical guidelines checklist that needs to be signed off on and submitted. A couple of things to keep in mind with this is that 
A separate AA needs to be submitted for each spoke site, regardless of how many programs there are in an agency. So if, if you're an agency that has one main site and 20 satellites and you want to offer telepsychiatry in 10 of those satellites plus your main site, we need a separate AA for every identified spoke site because we need to review each situation. We need to go in and take a look at the space, the equipment for each individual spoke site. There can be more than one hub site involved with a specific spoke site. So maybe you're going to want to have two doctors providing services from two different agencies. It's fine to have both of those hub sites identified within that AA. Uh, we just ask that it's pretty clearly defined where those hub sites will be. The second thing that will happen once that AA has been submitted is the, the regional field office will review all the documents. If everything looks complete, they'll support it. Um, oftentimes, they will be submitting that information to me here at central office for review if there's any questions. Um, but a lot of times, they're able to review everything and they'll conditionally support that AA. The next thing that will happen will be a site visit. We call it a pre-opening site visit to the spoke site. So they're going to want to go in and take a look at the space. What does the room look like? We want to make sure that it's equal to a space that you would use for an in-person session. The size of the room should be adequate. Is there confidentiality? We've gotten some feedback from providers early on that, for example, they were using one of the large screens up on the wall, one of the VTC screens, and people in the next room were able to hear the conversations because it was on the wall. So that wasn't confidential, so we're trying to kind of learn some lessons from that, so it's really important for that site visit for the field office to come out. Um, the other thing they're wanting to look at is that they can remotely connect to the hub site and that that hub site has that ability to use that pan tilt zoom. Keep in mind, again, if you have a spoke site that's connecting with more than one hub site, the field office is going to want to connect with every single hub site that's identified, whether it's just one or five. They're going to want to be able to have that ability to do that. If that visit goes well, the field office will support the AA, and then here at central office, we'll send out that amended operating certificate identifying telepsychiatry as an optional or additional service. Um, another thing to kind of keep in mind with this process is if you're a site that's been approved for telepsychiatry as a spoke site, if you decide that you want to make some changes to your hub site, um, maybe a doctor is leaving or you want to add on an additional hub site, that does not require a new AA to be submitted. You just simply need to be in touch with the field office to let them know what that change is, whether you're adding somebody, deleting somebody. Um, we just need to know. We're, we're trying to keep a pretty good list of the active um, hub and spoke sites going forward. So in a nutshell, that's the licensing process. And up to this point, which actually I think has even changed a little bit since I did this last week, but statewide we have 25 local providers that have been approved and that are utilizing telepsychiatry services. Um, most of those are outpatient clinics, so it's within main sites and satellites, some school-based sites. A few, I think three, are inpatient units at this point. And out of that, uh, we also have nine that are uh, state-operated providers. And currently we have 10, but I think that, like as I said, I think that's gone up a little bit since we last um, reviewed this number. I think we might be up to 15 or maybe even 20 pending um, for local providers. So that's everything for my piece of it. And um, I think I'm going to pass it over to Andrew so that he can talk a little bit about how this has worked in person with Aster. Um, I know there was a lot of back and forth between the field office and central office and Aster um, trying to kind of refine this. So I will pass it over to him to uh, continue. Thank you. Hello, thanks, Amy. Um, 
I'm Andrew Kunz. I'm the Deputy Director for Aster Services uh, in the Bronx. Uh, I am in charge of the outpatient program. We have um, two full service sites, uh, outpatient clinics, Article 31. One is our children OPC, which is in the North Central Bronx, and then our hybrid OPC, which is in the Southwest Bronx. Um, we also have uh, a slew of school satellite clinics. Uh, we have we are in 26 different schools in the Bronx with um, licensed satellite clinics, and we were particularly interested in telepsychiatry as a support for our school clinics. Um, we have started with a cohort of six uh, spoke sites that we wanted to license first, and we plan to roll out. Um, new cohorts of six every couple of months. So we have six that are, are fully licensed that have been approved, and we have six applications pending, and in a couple of months we'll do another six. We also have uh, two satellite clinics in foster care agencies, and we want to also have them receive uh, telepsychiatry approval as well. Um, I'm going to turn it over to our IT specialist, Sean Cernecki, who can give you um, an idea of our IT setup. Thanks, Andy. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Sean Cernecki. I am the network support technician for Aster Services. I uh, pretty much handle everything technology related in the Bronx. And when this came about, uh, it was it was very different in the beginning uh, and definitely involved over time, uh, but at the end of the day, uh, we were able to provide a uh, very streamlined, simple, but secure solution. Uh, so before I go ahead and start talking about, you know, the particular hardware and everything you see on your screen here, uh, the one thing I'm going to point out uh, that I think is probably one of the most important things that any agency is going to have to deal with as far as uh, getting this type of solution running is developing a best case, a standard case, and a worst case connectivity scenario. Uh, because when you're setting up these types of things uh, at all these different locations, you know every location uh, that you apply for is, is likely going to have a different uh, connectivity solution, whether it be direct Ethernet, uh, Wi-Fi, or it in some cases, uh, we actually have to go with the worst case scenario, which is basically using, uh, you know, cellular uh, internet service, you know, via a jetpack of sorts, uh, whether it be from Verizon, AT&T, or whomever uh, the best case scenario for that particular site may be. Uh, so if you have the opportunity to develop those sort of uh, things well beforehand, uh, before you even start talking about hardware, uh, I think that's really important. Uh, and then also ensuring that the connectivity from the hub and the spoke site is encrypted in transit and at rest, uh, because as I'm sure uh, if there's other IT folks on uh, listening to uh, this presentation now, security is pretty high up there as far as the uh, uh, concerns for any agency, and especially with uh, such sensitive material you know, being transmitted via video and audio communication. So uh, I think it was outlined a bit uh, briefly uh, toward the beginning of this presentation that there were three different solutions really. Uh, you know, the first solution is, you know, if, if you're fortunate enough uh, to be able to explore, uh, you know, a dedicated video conferencing uh, like a Cisco telepresence or a Cisco video conferencing uh, room, uh, that actually uh, they, they rent out uh, to agencies and, and other businesses uh, to utilize for telepsychiatry. It is probably one of the mo most expensive options, um, but I think one of the nice pieces of that uh, particular option is that, you know, all of the back-end support, uh, configuration, uh, execution is all handled by a third-party vendor. Uh, of course, there's some positives and negatives to that as well. Um, however, uh, with that in mind, it wasn't the most cost-effective solution for us in particular, so we decided to go with our own 
Uh, we didn't go PC-based, we actually went Mac-based. Uh, actually, way in the beginning, we were uh, initially intending on using FaceTime. However, uh, like it's already been described, uh, the pan, zoom, and tilt became a absolute necessity. Uh, so, the Mac solution still ended up being uh, great for us. Uh, for a slew of different reasons, um, but in particular, uh, with any Windows machine or any, any Microsoft setup, uh, the one thing that I always uh, err on the side of caution in, uh, of is uh, those pesky Windows updates. Uh, one of the last things you want to occur, you know, during a telepsychiatry session is, you know, the doc boots up the machine and all of a sudden has, you know, anywhere from a few to a couple hundred updates to apply, and that could, you know, certainly affect scheduling. It could affect the appointment itself um, and, you know, numerous other things. So that was part of the decision as to why we went uh, with a Mac in particular, um, you know, not to mention, you know, other aspects, but that was one of the main ones. Uh, not to say that you can't uh, configure a, uh, a Windows machine to uh, not update at particular times. Um, but as far as, you know, a get up and go solution, you know, the Mac solution worked out very well for us. So as you can see here, uh, our particular, the particular units that we're using uh, at our hub locations are uh, mostly 27 inch. Uh, we do have some 21 inch uh, lying around. Um, and then the spoke locations are actually much the same. Um, depending on the location, again, um, I'd like to actually provide uh, to the group, if possible, uh, we, we developed a, uh, a spoke uh, telepsychiatry survey, and it asks uh, basically whatever site you're applying for, you know, what kind of connectivity they have, what connectivity options there are, uh, information about the room. Um, you know, and, and things of that nature. So you can find out all that stuff well beforehand so you know exactly what you're getting into at each particular location. Uh, so for our folks, you know, it really depends on the building, it depends on the location, uh, and it really depends on what works best for that particular scenario. So again, uh, we have Mac solutions back and forth. Um, the, uh, the cameras which we decided to use uh, are displayed here. Uh, they're, you know, as far as cost, uh, minimal. Uh, in comparison to uh, what a full pan zoom tilt camera uh, came in at. Uh, I think the cameras that we initially spec'd out for this solution, uh, which provided, you know, uh, pan zoom and tilt remote, uh, came in right between $3,500 to $4,700 a piece. Uh, so again, you know, you have to really be mindful as far as, you know, what what really works best, that, uh, you know, both, uh, both in a uh, cost effectiveness and, and technologically as well. Uh, so I think on the next slide here, it describes, yes, it does. So the video conferencing software that we landed on is actually a vendor called Zoom. Uh, and one of the most important things that I wanted to ensure uh, that, uh, you know, we had that I touched on in the beginning is that we had encryption on both ends. Uh, in transit and at rest, uh, because I didn't want anything get in, getting intercepted. I didn't want uh, the communication to, to be broken in any way. Uh, and the, the licensing costs are actually pretty favorable. Uh, I, I believe uh, for uh, 10 licenses, uh, we actually uh, came in at just about half the cost of a camera uh, that would have provided the same thing. Uh, so that's actually worked out quite well for us. Um, again, uh, to kind of sum up, you know, as far as a, a hardware and technical solution, I mean, ask as many questions as you possibly can uh, beforehand. Um, the Mac solution has worked best for us. Uh, that might be different for other agencies, uh, depending on how well you can, you know, manage uh, those types of uh, possible issues as far as Windows updates occurring, you know, on boot which could definitely cause an pretty number one, connectivity number two, develop a best case, a worst case, and a standard case. Uh, test all three. Uh, make sure that the, you know, obviously at the, even the worst case scenario, you can still perform the telepsychiatry session, you know, with minimal issues. You know, uh, obviously uh, no issues is always best. Uh, 
and then uh, you know, like I had mentioned, the the Zoom uh, our that vendor that we ended up collaborating with, uh, they've been great throughout the entire process. Uh, we even have a feature called the waiting room. Uh, so much like a regular doctor's office, while the doctor is performing a telepsychiatry session, there's literally no chance uh, that the uh, the doctor uh, will get interrupted by another telepsychiatry call. Uh, I do see something that came up in the chat that says, does Zoom provide a BAA? They did, um, had no issues with that, uh, you know, no, uh, no qualms about signing the business associate agreement at all. Uh, and they worked with us in every step of the way, uh, totally HIPAA compliant, uh, and I believe they're using 256-bit uh, encryption on both ends. Uh, so they're fully approved for telemedicine practices, and uh, they've been great. Uh, so I'm pretty sure I've, uh, I've bored everybody by now, and I'm going to pass it right back over to Andy. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. So we um, we still consider ourselves kind of in beta mode for uh, telepsychiatry. Our, our licenses are, are about four months old. We've been doing it for about four months. And, and with this first cohort of, of six satellite clinics, um, one of the things that, that we found was that licensing took a lot longer than we thought. And I think it was probably because both we and ONH were kind of in learning mode around telepsychiatry, and um, so there was a lot of back and forth. But it did get worked out. Um, I, I think probably we um, will allow more time for licensing issues as we go forward. But it also gave us um, an opportunity to take a look at what was um, happening around the country and in literature. And we found the American Telemedicine Association website particularly useful. They have um, message boards, they have an annual conference, and uh, we got a lot of information from there. Um, it also gave us um, a chance to work out some of our um, initial um, issues with uh, one of our most difficult aspects of rolling out telepsychiatry, which was really scheduling and how to use staff efficiently on site. Um, and I'll, I'll speak more about that later, but um, the other thing that we found out was that, that connectivity is really a moving target. Um, you can have very stable um, connectivity at your hub site, but at your spoke sites, especially if you're going to be using a lot of spoke sites like we are, connectivity is really dependent on um, the bandwidth that they can access at, at the uh, clinic satellite. So there was a lot of back and forth with us to, even with, with just our first uh, satellite clinic that we started, um, with trying to find the optimal um, solution for that particular uh, satellite clinic. Um, also, just because connectivity is stable at one minute doesn't mean that an hour or later it's going to remain that way. It, especially if you're using Wi-Fi, it's dependent on um, the school and, and the, the uh, amount of, of data that they're trying to get through that bandwidth. And so it does vacillate from day to day and from times to time. Um, so I, I guess one of our lessons learned was that, that the IT resources for telepsychiatry were certainly a lot more than, than we had thought we were um, going to be allocating. And um, we've learned to that um, it requires much more support than we initially thought. Um, there also has to be kind of a, a plan B for what happens in, um, in session when connectivity goes down. Our experience was that we usually had fairly good visual, but that the sound quality often was compromised. And when it went down too far, then we had to resort to um, uh, supplementing it with, with phones, uh, which is certainly not the best, but um, it, it was something that worked. Um, if it didn't work at all, then when we would have to void the session and we would um, see the client at the, the main clinic. Thank <laughs> you.
Um, get some other kind of miscellaneous thoughts of, uh, about lessons that we learned was that um, uh, the, our electronic clinical record took some time to, um, to gear up for um, the telepsychiatry monitor and to test. Um, it uh, ended up working out fine, but um, it w was some back and forth with our, um, our ECR company to get those modifiers in. Um, another lesson was that um, we really need to, to involve front office and scheduling staff as well as our medical providers in developing procedures um, as well as the, the clinicians on site at the spokes. Uh, communication was really one of our primary issues, especially around scheduling issues, which um, I think were, were um, a surprise for us. We have an electronic medical record and we can schedule remotely, um, but it involved a lot of coordina coordination between the clinician, the, um, the nurse, um, the, the NPP or the MD, and uh, the, the, the client and parent. And, and that's a lot to ask an on-site clinician to do. Um, we can supplement that with our front office work, but um, communication is, is still kind of a moving target for us. And that's another reason why we wanted to roll these things out in cohorts, because we wanted to take manageable chunks at a time to be able to uh, work out these communication issues. Um, we started out early informing parents. Uh, we had notices, we had uh, written literature that we sent home, we had therapists talking to parents about um, telepsychiatry, just for informational purposes at first, and then um, later to uh, discuss informed consent. Um, we also uh, talked a lot about, um, with our psychiatrists about who they feel would be um, good for inclusion and exclusion. So we wanted to make sure that we started our telepsychiatry services with stable patients, not medically fragile, um, who had um, been seen in the clinic uh, a reasonable amount of time and that were known to the psychiatrist before um, rolling out telepsychiatry at the remote site. Uh, that seemed to go pretty well. Um, also, we found that with our, our, nurse, our, our nurse practitioners and our, our psychiatrists that there was a, a variance in the comfort level with telepsychiatry. We had some uh, of our psychiatrists who were not at all comfortable with doing telepsychiatry, um, and we had some who, who were very comfortable doing it. Um, we certainly wanted to um, respect the um, practitioners if they were not comfortable with telepsych, but we also wanted to work with them so that they would eventually become more, um, more comfortable with that. Um, one of the things that, that helped them become more comfortable was to make sure that everybody knew about contingency plans for emergencies. So if there was an emergency in the session, what were the backup? Um, what was the backup plan? Was the client going to be seen at the main clinic or, um, or is mobile crisis or the emergency room going to be contacted? Um, and how quickly, if, if the clinician was not present in the session, um, how quickly could they be accessed and did we have all of the contact information to make it, them quickly accessible? Um, also, we had to um, involve our, our school partners in this, too, because um, this was a new um, idea for them that, the, that uh, their students would receive telepsychiatry services. Um, it was warmly received by all of our initial six uh, satellite schools, um, and they were very pleased and really saw it as a win-win situation for everybody, as, as did we, because it got the parents into the schools, uh, gave the schools an opportunity to um, offer services while the parent was on site. Um, it gave us an opportunity to offer more services to the parents on site and um, to do some coordinating work with parent and school and client.
Um, uh, again, uh, uh, the scheduling was was um, one of our, our biggest problems, and still still remains uh, a problem. Coincidentally, um, just we we also at the same time um, experimented with just in time psychiatry, which did not work out well in our main clinics for a variety of reasons, but mostly because um, parents um, objected to. Um, that method of scheduling, but it did work well with the schools. Um, we have since modified our just-in-time scheduling, um, but it did point out that um, the parents who came into the schools for, for telepsychiatry services liked the immediacy of just-in-time uh, psychiatry. Um, uh, and finally, um, our, our kind of last learning curve was that, that after we started to roll this out, um, our psychiatrist said, well, what about weights and measures for the client? Um, and so we kind of had to confer about how we were going to handle um, weights and measures, and uh, we ended up um, sending out a, a registered nurse and an LPN to our different satellite clinics. Um, to do weights and measures for clients um, rather than to, uh, to train the clinicians to do that. Um, and that worked for the first cohort of six schools, but I do not think it's going to work as we roll out all of these schools. Um, we probably will um, need to hire an LPN just to um, serve our telepsychiatry when all of our schools are, are approved. Um, and we will probably also be scheduling um, in bundles, meaning that one site will have um, every other Monday as their telepsychiatry time um, and so on so that we can efficiently move around our uh, support personnel. So I'm going to um, transfer back to Amy um, and we'll look forward to your questions. All right. Actually, um I, I think, if I'm not mistaken, uh, I, uh, this is Boris again. We'll come back. And uh, first, let me let me say thank you for all the presenters. Um, and um, unless, Amy, if, if you did have something that you wanted to jump in, um, you're more than happy to open that. If, if not, um, I think we can move into our uh, the Q&A portion of the presentation. Yeah, I think, Boris, the only thing, I, the one slide I skipped over was just the links um, to our OMH telepsych page and then um, a couple of links to the ATA, which both um, Andy and Sean mentioned. So those are there for people just to help them get to where they need to be for information. But that's it. Excellent. Thank you very much. So uh, let's move into our, our question component. We've got quite a few questions, so thank you, and keep them coming again. Uh, please use the chat box. Uh, to put the questions through. So um, I think the first number of questions, Amy, uh, it seems like it's probably going to be towards and, and for you, but uh, let's see how, um, you know, who can feel them the best. So the first one here is, can you build when uh, using telepsychiatry for consultation? Um, well, <laughs> That's kind, that is kind of a difficult question. I think I'll have to get back to you on that one. I mean, primarily it's for the face-to-face. -face. It's not necessarily for the consultation piece. Okay. That's not, not a problem. All right. So we'll, we'll put a hold on that one. And as I said earlier, if there's questions we can't uh, get to or can't answer uh, today, we'll definitely circulate those when we uh, have uh, more time to review and we'll share that with the presenters. Um, so, and I think there are a number of questions uh, just mentioning the, the, the idea of concept of being able to do telepsychiatry, um, especially for disabled individuals in their home. Um, any, and I know right now that's, I believe, not an approved uh, process. Um, is there any thought on that, Amy, in, in regards to maybe in the future uh, being able to provide telepsychiatry for individuals who maybe are homebound? Um, there has been a lot of discussion around that. I think one of the biggest hurdles that we're coming up against at this point is DOH statute, which limits the ability to do 
those type of visits ongoing and actually providing like counseling services or medication management. I think at this point, the only services that are provided in the home are for um, remote patient monitoring, which is different than, than what telepsychiatry would be. Um, so it's definitely on the radar. There's been a lot of talk about it and, um, you know, that's part of where we're looking at some of those specialized services are for people that really there is no other option. Um, there's definitely talk about it. All right, great, thank you. And a couple of, I guess, uh, just clarifying uh, questions here as well. Um, so one is, does the patient need to be in an Article 31 space uh, for telepsychiatry to happen? Yes, yep, they, they do. They have to be located in the Article 31 space um, that they're, that's approved for telepsychiatry. Yep, the clinic great. or the site that they're enrolled in, yes. Gotcha, thank you. And a couple of, I guess, the tech requirements. Uh, folks are wondering if anybody knows, are these, are these tech requirements the same for DOH um, and I guess CMS, meaning Medicare, and, and maybe even FQHC stuff? Uh, and are you aware if there's uh, major differences? Or, because I know you mentioned you try to align these up as much as possible. Uh, that's a that's a really good question. I don't I don't know if our technical aspects are lined up as much with um, those for DOH. I you know I'm not sure. I'd have to check. I know we're really working on language and and making sure those types of things are consistent. So I don't know if it's as much on the technical piece, but I can gotcha. look into that. All right. Thank you. Um, yep. All right. Let's. Let's just move uh, through some of this, um, just looking through some of the, I guess is the, uh, there's a question, is the licensing process the same for hospitals? I assume hospitals who have mental health licensing uh, as well, there'd be a reason why they'd be different? Yep, no, there's no different process. It's, it's the same for any th Article 31 license site, regardless of inpatient, outpatient. Yep, it's exactly the same. Yeah. And, and I guess this is, this one might be more for Esther folks, but uh, maybe you can also jump in here, Amy. A question about just what was the time frame of getting the administrative approval? And I know, Andy, you mentioned this was kind of just new for you and even though Mage Field Office, so maybe that's not the best measurement here since it was kind of new. But any sense uh, how long it, it took, just even for that period? For, for um, I. Go ahead. Uh, go ahead, Andy. You can talk first. <laughs> um, for our, our, our first series of six satellites, it took eight months. I, I expect that that will be a lot less now, and, and we did get caught in between um, developing regulations because Tilt Pan and Zoom came along at about the four-month level, and so we kind of had to um, revamp not only our application but our technology, too. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, that's definitely not the norm for it to take that long, but you're right, Andy, that, that is exactly what happened is we were still under the 599.17 regs, and then we made a lot of changes, and you guys were definitely caught in the middle of that. Um, you know, I think it's, it's really hard to put a number on how long it can take exactly, but, you know, a, in a lot of instances, we have providers reaching out to myself and the field office in advance of submitting that administrative action, and I think that that's been really helpful when that happens because we can answer a lot of the questions ahead of time. Um, in some instances, they've been submitting some of their plans and the equipment that they're looking to use, and we're able to tell them you know, as soon as we can, oh, you might need to adjust this, or this equipment isn't, isn't really going to be the best, or it's not approved for use. Um, and then by the time they submit that administrative action, everything is in place, and it can happen in a month or two. Um, it really, it's just so dependent on so many factors. And a lot of it, I think what we found is that um, for the providers, getting the equipment, you know, depending on how many sites they're looking at, depending on what type of equipment they're looking to use, which I think Sean touched on with the cost. Um, sometimes, even though that administrative action has been submitted, 
there could be months where there's a wait on getting that equipment actually installed and, and working at the spoke site. And, you know, the, the field office can't go out to do that last visit, that pre-opening visit, until that equipment is in place. So that sometimes right. can slow things. And finding a doctor. <laughs> so. Right. Got it. Well, thank you for that answer. Uh, Andy, this one is uh, for you, because somebody actually said Andy here. Um, how has the response been from the parents at the school sites where this already been uh, rolled out? Um, it, it's been uniformly positive, and I checked again on that this morning. Um, our, our parents are really appreciating the convenience of being able to go to their local school to receive psychiatric services. Um, the only complaints that we've received is, is when we feel that we need to see the child um, or youth in our main clinics um, because medications are changing or the psychiatrist wants to increase the dosage or something like that. Um, but it's been very positive. It's also been very positive from the host environments, too. Our, our schools are very supportive of, of this service. That's, that is great to hear. Thank you. Um, Amy, I think that we have a number of questions so I'm going to try to kind of summarize. I think there's still kind of a little confusion about the hub and the spoke um, and kind of just to clarify who needs to be Article 31 or OMH license, who doesn't. Um, can you, because uh, I, I think instead of going through all these questions which seem to be similar, uh, can like in a minute or so go, go, go through that one more time? Yeah, absolutely. That That is one of the, um, the most confusing pieces, I think, of all of this. So um, just as a reminder, the spoke site, or what we would call the originating site, is where the client sits, and the distant or hub site is where that prescriber or provider is sitting. Um, the spoke site, in order for us to be involved, the spoke site has to be an Article 31 licensed provider. Um, if it's not, we're generally not involved in that type of a situation. The only times that we would be is if that hub site where the doctor is sitting is an Article 31 licensed site that wants to provide some contracting services um, to an Article 30 or to a non-Article 31 site. Then they just have to let the field office know. But if it's you know an Article 28 to an Article 28 or a 32 to a 32, we have we have really no piece in that. Um, that has nothing to do with us. The, the approval process and the regulations apply to the Article 31 licensed providers. Got it. And, and just to be clear, does the hub have to be also an OMH licensed facility um, or not? No. no. Nope. That was one of the things with our expansion that we said that it no longer had to be an Article 31 licensed site or provider. Nope. Beautiful. Just the, just the to, spoke site. Got it. But I think, did you mention again, we have a couple of questions on this, but the hub site or at least the psychiatrist has to be somewhere in New York State. That, was that accurate or? Yes, yep, they have to be um, licensed in New York State and they have to be located in a New York State Medicaid enrolled site. They obviously also have to be enrolled in Medicaid, but so individually they have to be New York State Medicaid enrolled and the site that they're sitting at has to be New York State Medicaid enrolled. Got it. Uh, thank you for the uh, clarification. So I think we have um, time for maybe one more question. Um, and let me just see. And and again, <clears throat> it it there was a question, and I just wanted to to make sure uh, to clarify. And Amy, jump in here. Um, you know, you do need to talk to your field office and obtain an administrative uh, action. It's not just um, if you're going to be using uh, a contracting entity for this. It's even just to get this on your license, because there were some questions about. When do I do the administrative action? I think, from what I understood at least, you have to do it uh, even if everybody works for you and, and it's kind of all in-house. Um, is that correct? Yes, yep. yes, that is true. So even, I, mean, I think Aster is probably a good example because the, the doctor is in-house, but they still had to submit those administrative actions for all of those individual spoke sites. Got it. 
Thank you. Well, I think we're basic, we're at time here. Again, I want to thank all of our presenters, Amy, Andy, uh, Sean, for, for this wonderful presentation. As I said, uh, this uh, presentation has been recorded. Actually, the, uh, the presentation itself is already available. It's just the recording is not at the moment. I also want to say thank you to Jocelyn and Serena, who've been in the background uh, making all of this happen. And thank you for all for participating. And I uh, hope this was helpful. And hope uh, more people can uh, apply and will be thinking of applying to uh, provide telepsychiatry. Um, thank you to all. And have a great day. Thank you. Bye. Bye.